Oh, when you mentioned Larry Sanders, I was going to ask uh, if you had a favorite uh, Rip Torn story. <clears throat> well, that you can tell. I can, I can tell him, and he's dead now. So it's well, that's not, true too. Yeah, good point. Not like he's going to come get me. Um, <laughs> I have two two Rip Torn stories. One of them, one of them is not doesn't sound like a Rip Torn story, but um, Rip was a real cunt. I mean, <laughs> there's no other way to say it, and there's. <laughs> I, I don't think I'm hazarding an unkind guess when I say there was some alcohol abuse involved in his life. Um, he, he was not, he wouldn't drink too much at work. <laughs> so that wasn't really an issue. And he was, he was wonderful on the show, but he was an, he was an asshole. I mean, and he would target uh, other he would target somebody a member of the crew or somebody else in the cast never gary yeah. as the as the as the object for his abuse in a in a particular week and i have three stories okay and so th this became a problem and gary and i are were not confrontational people but we realized that we had to deal with this. <laughs> so here we are, two of the least confrontational people in the world with the most confrontational person. <laughs> so we called him into Gary's office. And Gary and I were on one side and Rip was in a chair by himself. And I was so proud of Gary because he just laid it out. He <laughs> said, Rip, you are abusive. You are unprofessional. You are a bully, and it's not helping the work atmosphere. And it's going to change. He just laid it right out. But Rip, let me see if I can go do this now. So Rip's in a chair, like across yeah. from him, right? Except yeah. the legs are as far apart as they can get. Okay, <laughs> he's like fucking man spreading like crazy, and he's like like this, leaning into us. Okay, Le yeah. listening to this, right? Yeah. And so Gary lays it all out. And I swear to God, Rip goes, yeah. <laughs> his, his response is like, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> I swear to God, that's his response. <laughs> and, of course, and of course, we got nothing because we can't fire him. He's so, you know, he's integra integrally important <laughs> to the fucking show. So we can't fire him. So he's got us by the balls. So Gary just kind of goes, well, just try and be better. <laughs> End of meeting. End of meeting. Okay, great. The second story was by the end of the third season, and this probably happened, That what I just told you probably happened early in the third season. But by the end of the third season, I was exasperated by him. Just fucking exasperated. It takes a lot to push me to that level. And we did, a we did a table read of a script, and then Gary and I and the director that week went back to Gary's office and talked through the script and made some changes. We cut some stuff and we, whatever. And when we were done, the director was gonna go back to the stage and give these notes to the cast. And the director said to me, um, would you come with me to do this? And I said, I don't think I should. I just, I just knew my, I was, I was, something was in the air, you know, and I had reached my limit. And I said, I don't think I should, but I, but I went. <laughs> and the first note cuts Wally Langham's part in half for the week. And it also removes one line of rips. And I hear rip across the table and he's going like this. Well, I guess I shouldn't have come in this week. I guess I should. This is exactly what he said. I guess I should come in this week. I guess I should have taken a vacation in Tahiti. <laughs> and I just went, Rip, we just cut Wally's part in half. And you've got one line that's been taken out. And you and you and I lose it. I fucking lose it. I, I am on my feet across the table going, fuck you. Fuck you. <laughs> get off the stage. I said, get off the fucking stage. I'm sick of looking at you, you prick. And he's up on his feet. You can't talk to me like that. But, so we're just yelling at each other across this table. 
fuck you. No, fuck you. Uh, you know? And there's 40 seconds. It's like a long time of us just going, fuck you. Well, at a certain point, I realized he's not leaving. I'm trying to kick him off the stage, but he's not leaving. So I just go, all right, let's go back to the notes. All right. So, <laughs> and I sit down, and my heart, you know, I sit down, and the director continues the notes. But I'm not, now Rip's over there, okay? He's over there, but I'm not looking over there. I'm looking over here at like Janine Garofalo, and the yeah. director's over here. So I'm director there, Janine here. And at one point, I look at Janine, and she goes like this. <laughs> She runs her finger down her cheek yeah. and she's telling me I made him cry. <laughs> I made Rip cry. Wow. So the notes end and he pushes away from the table and he goes, I guess I'll call my agent. <laughs> and he stalks off the stage and you can just hear clump, 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 clump. Footsteps into the distance, stage door <laughs> opens, stage door slams shut. Everybody at the table goes... Like they've been waiting. <laughs> they've been waiting for three years for somebody to call this fucking guy out. <laughs> so that's not the end of the story. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the next day, I say to Rip, I'm not going to apologize to you. You don't deserve it. <laughs> and also, you don't deserve to have me take an interest in your work. So from now on, just do whatever you want. For the rest of the season, there may be two more episodes. I said, you know, just do whatever you want. You won't, I'm not going to be watching. Have fun. Bye. <laughs> that was it. And then the season was over. And, and I remember this was back when they had the Ace Awards, you know, the Edsel of, the Edsel of awards. <laughs> and uh, they used to give, you know, like 90 awards in a half hour ceremony. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm there with my wife and I'm just, I'm bugged because I, I'm, I'm still, upset that I lost my cool, you know, to yeah. that level. And I start to think about Rip and I start to think about myself and I'm like, why doesn't he understand that we're just all working towards the same goal? Yeah. That, you know, and I'm, you know, why doesn't he get it? And as I sit there, I start to think, I'm gonna write an episode about this. <laughs> and I see him again at the Emmys and it's very much like the alcoholics, you know, thing where after a big fight, oh, I love you, my brother, oh, you know, big hug and everything. And I said, I'm gonna, I said, I'm going to write you a script next season. That's all I said. I don't say what it's about or anything like that. And the show is, the show's called Arthur After Hours. And it's a thing where he has a, Arthur has a fight with Larry yeah. and then ends up spending the night in the studio alone. And it's a tour de force. You get, he does quote Shakespeare. He sings with a karaoke machine at center stage on the talk show set. <laughs> during, during the night, he makes friends with a uh, Romanian or something janitor who works up there. And the whole idea of the thing was these are two men who are, should be working towards the same goal. It doesn't look like it, but <laughs> one, of them, one of them cleans up during the day and the other one cleans up at night. Yeah. They're both doing the same job. And they connect and they have a falling out. <laughs> <laughs> And then the show ends, you know, the next day, Larry seems to have completely forgotten about any sort of argument that they had and the, sh and the show ends. And I just want to say that life and show business especially is fucking unfair. <laughs> we had been nominated for so many Emmy Awards and the first Emmy Award we won was Rip for that <laughs> episode. <laughs> so the motherfucker <laughs> behaves like a lunatic. I call him out. I write him a script. He wins an Emmy. What the fuck? How is this fair? <laughs> oh, by the way, I didn't win. I got nominated. So, you know, sometimes I'd be nominated twice in the same fucking category and I'd lose. <laughs> Jesus Christ. That takes not... talent. So here's the last story. We, okay. had Bert, we have Burt Reynolds on, on the show. You can tell this story too because everyone's dead. Oh, there you go. What luck for me that everyone has passed away. Yep. Uh, so Burt Reynolds is in an episode of Larry Sanders. And he's... Yeah. And so Rillstein Gray has... Uh, who is producing the show. They have a... 
kid there is sort of a runner and they say, you just take care of Mr. Reynolds when he gets here. And they just say, get him whatever he wants. Okay. So the kid says when Burt Reynolds gets there, I'm supposed to get you whatever you want. And <laughs> Burt Reynolds says, okay, I want a bottle of vodka and a bottle of soda. <laughs> the kid doesn't ask anybody. He just goes out and gets it. Okay, so by the time by the time Burt Reynolds comes down to shoot his scene, he's he's been in both bottles. Okay, and like he's supposed he's he, the whole scene is he's talking to Larry. He's supposed to be Larry's neighbor, and he's talking to him over the fence. And the fence is just a brick wall, and it's a wall, and it's got fake brick all over it, you know. But it looks like a brick wall. Yeah. And Burt Reynolds goes, uh, "What am I? What am I doing over here? What am I doing?" <laughs> and so, well, you just, you see Larry, you're talking to him over the fence. He goes, yeah, but I want to be doing something. Uh, I, want, I, I want to be digging a hole. Okay, so we get a bucket of dirt and a shovel. And he's digging over there. And at one point, he even throws dirt over the fence onto Gary. <laughs> Gary doesn't know this is going to happen. So it's just kind of like, what? What the fuck, dude? <laughs> well, something happens. I don't remember what. But Bert fucking melts down in a way that I've never seen before or since, just has a complete fucking meltdown on the set. He, at one point, he's, he's clawing at the fake brick on the wall and tearing it off and throwing it at the crew, at the camera crew. He completely fucking explodes. And this goes on for a while. Now, I find myself standing next to who? Rip. And we're both watching this whole thing. And then Bert charges off the stage and disappears. And I just look at Rip. I just look at him. And Rip goes, Bert's a troubled boy. <laughs> <laughs> and I just go, well, is that the pot calling the kettle black? Is it? Bert's a, Bert's a troubled boy. Well, you know, wouldn't you? Bert's a troubled boy. <laughs> And the, 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 the painful coda to that story is now the producers are all like drawing lots to see who's going to go upstairs <laughs> to talk to Bert. Yeah. And it was um, John, um, oh God, I can't remember his name right now, but he was our, line, John Ziffrin, who was our, line, who was our line producer. And he says, I'll do it. <laughs> and he goes up and the door is slightly ajar and he <laughs> knocks on it and he says, Mr. Reynolds, and he pushes the door open and Bert is sitting in the center of the room in a chair, you know, hunched over, <laughs> you know, just staring. And he says, Mr. Reynolds, are you okay? And Bert Reynolds says, I was the number one box office star from 1972 to 1976. That's what he says. Just this hollow look in his eyes, just so small, you know, and defeated. And that's what he says. It was just heartbreaking, you know? That is. Uh, that, that's just fucking show business right there. Yikes. I only have one other great, like this, by the way, that's not the only time that I or somebody went into somebody's trailer to talk to them after something like that and found them crying and saying, I had a career in film. And now, you know, whatever. You, uh, you told me that story, although you did not tell me... <laughs> You did not tell me the names or the show, but that, that was person, able, to work, that able to work them out. That person's still alive. Yes. So anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but how about, I mean, I just, that, that's just like an amazing story to me. The other one was um, just about show business. She is a whore. And I think there was just a very mild earthquake here about 25 seconds ago. So if you saw the, if you saw any kind of things like this. <laughs> um, I'm doing uh, analyze this. Yeah. We're starting to shoot in New York, uh, actually starting in New Jersey. And I'm in the city and Billy wants to talk to me about the script. But Harold Ramis has sort of already said to me, don't do anything else to the script. <laughs> don't, don't get involved with the script. Yeah. So I've sort of been told, like, try not to do anything else. So I say to Billy, hey, you know what? You've never taken me to the Friars Club. Let's go to the Friars Club and have lunch. <laughs> and he says, okay. 
And he's saying to me, like, this is going to be great because <laughs> you're going to get to meet Gene Balos. Well, I, I knew that name. Well. Gene Balos is just one of those guys who's like, you know, who's usually described as like a comics comic. Okay. You know, he just never made it big, but he was always, you know, someplace on the bill. And, you know, he was, he's just somebody other comics go fucking Gene Balos. So here's Billy Crystal is saying to me, you're going to meet Gene Balos. He is fucking the best. <laughs> you're not going to believe it. <laughs> and so we get there and we are shown to the table. And of course, Billy, big star, you know, so yeah. shown to the table. And he looks across the room and yep, there's Gene. And he says to the Mater D, tell Gene to come over. <laughs> now, the first tip off that maybe things are not quite right is that it takes 20 minutes for Gene to get across the room. And it's not, it's not because people are saying, hey, Gene, come here for a second. It's not that, <laughs> it's that's how long it takes him. And he comes to the table and he's clearly something has happened. It's a health issue here. And yeah. so Billy is, you know, talking to him and it's coming slowly and everything. And at some point, and this is the crystallization of show business for me. <laughs> at some point, Gene Bayless reaches into his inner pocket of his sport jacket and takes out a slightly crumpled, torn postcard. <laughs> and it's the marquee at the Sands Hotel in Vegas. And it says, Dean Martin... Blah, 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 Gene Balos. <laughs> and he says something to me like, you know, like I have to look at this postcard. And he says, you know, G, you know, Dean Martin, he's a great man. And I go, yeah, yeah. He takes the postcard back and shuffles away. And Billy is, I can see Billy is stricken. Yeah. And he calls the Mater D over and says, what, what happened? And they said, well, we think he had a stroke. Um, <laughs> but he hasn't gotten any medical help and won't and still comes here every day for lunch and walks. Now, I'm trying to figure out how he got across some of those major intersections in enough time. I don't know how he yeah. did it. He walked there every day, had lunch, and then walked home. It probably took him all day. I would think. At that rate. So Billy is staggered because he's you know, was clearly expecting this bundle of joy, you know, of seeing Gene Bayless again, and this is what yeah. he saw. So now we're leaving, and Gene's leaving, and he's sort of shuffling across the lobby, and Billy doesn't want to be, doesn't want to interact with him again, because he's so, so hurt, you know. Yeah. So he says, oh, let's go upstairs, and we'll look in the, we'll look at Mer Milton Berle's fossilized penis or something, I can't remember, <laughs> but we'll go upstairs. And so we, we look at other parts of the place, by the time we come back downstairs, he's gone, but he's only made it outside the front door. So it's like, all right, Gene, good to see you, so forth. And now we, there's a van waiting for Billy and I, and we go across the street, and now we're getting into the van, and I look across the street one last time, and Gene is still there, but he's now moved, so he's standing behind, from our vantage point, uh, one of those big green uh, uh, mail storage boxes. You know, it's, it's, like, it's like a mailbox, but it's green. It's that they just use it for storage. Yeah. And my eye goes down to the bottom of the box and I see a stream of urine and a puddle. So he is outside, he's outside the fryers, leaning against this post office thing, probably, you know, obviously with his dick out, taking a piss on 57th or whatever that street is. And I say to Billy, do not look across the street. <laughs> Whatever you do, if you want to have some shred of remembering Gene Delos the way it was, please don't look across the street. And of course, you know, you tell anybody don't look across the street, they're going to look. And that did it. That was just like, a knife. it was a knife in Billy's heart. It was, but I'll never forget him taking that fucking postcard out. This just curled, torn postcard and just, saying, hey, here's who I was. Yeah. Mm. I'm sorry, Will. I'm, I'm sure you, these are not the stories you wanted to hear. I, I don't have story standards. Come on. I, I, I want anecdotes, period. That, that, okay. I'm getting okay. those, that's for sure. <laughs> and I, I, I'm 
fairly sure Gene died a couple of years. They're not not soon after. That. I would tend to think so. That's yeah, poor bad. They they you know and, and the friars were like very protective. They said you know we've we've offered to drive him yeah. to to the club and then home again. Nope, he didn't want it. That was probably his whole day getting there yeah. and then turning around and getting back home. It probably took him that long to get home. People got pride. Jeez. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Uh, I'm just well, I'm thinking about my. Uh, my favorite ripped torn story that anyone has ever told me was, uh, okay. okay. Uh, and it's not even that long a story. It's just, it's so perfectly ripped torn. Um, from two and a half men, I'm blanking on her name right this second. Uh, just passed away. Conchita, Conchita. Uh, yeah, I could shout Farrell. Yeah. Yeah. She did the movie with him, Homeland. Uh, it was actually like, uh, they were like settlers or something, and it was, they went out, it was like a desert town they were filming it in. Yeah. And uh, she said, I got there and uh, Rip met me at the airport. And uh, I thought it was real nice of him. And he says, uh, would you like me to give you kind of a tour around town? And uh, he, she says, that'd be great. He's like, well, you know, here's this and here's this. And he's like driving all around saying, pointing out all the key landmarks. And uh, she said, well, Rip, when did you get here? And he said, oh, like two days ago. She's like, how do you know where everything is? Uh, I make a point of knowing the way out of any town I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I buy it. I buy it. <laughs> you remember near the end of his life when he broke into the bank? Yes. <laughs> you, know, you know how he got off, right? Actually, I don't think I do. He, um, one, one detail. One detail saved his ass. Um, because, you know, his... his the line that he was giving them was, I thought I was home. Yeah. Okay. Now look, <laughs> in, some of those, in some of those Connecticut towns, they do make businesses look like homes. They make them look like, you know, older colonial sort of, like even like a McDonald's is made to look, they'll put it into an original uh, old building. So it, I, I can sort of understand that. <laughs> Uh, but you had to break in, you know, that becomes yeah, a bit exactly. of a problem. So what happened was that he went in and they found him asleep on a couch in like the waiting area or something. And, but, you know, the one detail was, because he had said, I thought I was home, is that he had taken his boots off. And that did it. Yeah. They, clearly he thought he was home. He took his shoes off. That's fair. And, put, and left them by the door and then went to the thing. And they went, yeah, who would do that? <laughs> If you're going to rob a bank, you don't go in, take your shoes off, and take a nap. So, not. Oh, not as a rule. <laughs> what a fucking lunatic. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs>